I'm here today with Ariana Oluwole from Nanya Daycare and thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. We're here in Freetown. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is such a great day to share my story. Um, thank you for stopping by. <laughs> How did you how did you come to start this project? How did that happen? Wow. Okay, so um, I had a, my son and um, I realized that we didn't have very much early learning centers in Freetown then. I knew the value of um, early childhood education and being in a nurturing and, and, and engaging environment. Since my mother at that time was a retired teacher, um, so when I decided to quit my job, I found uh, so much joy in working with children before, just voluntarily. Um, I told myself that, okay, um, since I want to be with my child and I want to support his development, why not extend that care to other people around me? So initially, it was just like people in my community and my friends that I wanted to help out. But truth of the matter was I had to design a project that would make sense in the long run. So we had to have like two components to the business, uh, a for-profit side, and then still do what I love doing, which is just helping other people out. So Nanya was born in 2013 and i took like crash courses on early childhood education and and learned a whole lot from my mama um, who had, had been doing it for over 35 40 years then initially i was going to go solo and then i realized that there was no way i could do it alone and i invited her to come out of her retirement that we could come have a mother-daughter team since then, we have grown. We have uh, catered to over 900 children. And we now have a staff of 21 women. Wow. And a man. <laughs> Why so many women? Because I realized uh, tons of young girls, pretty, pretty young girls, full of knowledge, like very smart. But they were not really engaged, yet. totally dependent on handouts from family, totally dependent on who's going to marry them. And um, it was hard to get skilled staff in the beginning. So I was lucky, blessed enough to get connected with a program that's based in Sabia. It's called NTC. And NTC uh, supported me with a lot more training and hands-on um, experience, knowledge, day-to-day, um, -day updated uh, information on early childhood and education. I'm like, okay, I can't keep this to myself. How about bringing people who have the desire to learn on board, rather than taking someone who already has their paths carved out? So we started out an internship scheme for young girls who wanted to do something but were not opportuned, did not have like the right background, did not have people to motivate them. So it's a two-way thing. Um, you come in and we, you have like a learning experience, on-the-job training, and then you get a lot of um, training, workshops, self-esteem, early childhood courses, everything from learning how to care for a child, to playing with a child, to reading stories for the children. And interestingly, I'm, I'm very excited, very, very honored to say that most of the staff members that we now have came from that program. And every year we're still continuing on with that. So in the long run, um, communities around me are benefiting from having breadwinners women that they they are discarded oh you got pregnant as a teenager so there's no use for you and now going back certificate after certificate we do a lot of interactive um, programs 
safety seminars for our communities. They get to see them on TV. And you know how much that draws um, good attention and energy. People feel really renewed in terms of what is possible, what can happen. <laughs> I, I, I can go on and on. I'm pleased to, <laughs> but I will interject some questions here and there. <laughs> okay, so with the, with the kids, we, like I said, we had, so kids started paying and we struggled with how many kids should pay and how many kids shouldn't pay and how many kids could come for free. Okay, so this is your combination yes. of the for-profit and the non-profit. Non non okay. So what happened um, um, just after Ebola, we noticed that there were lots of kids that had um, parents that had died or their foster parents or extended families were not around. So we had a few of those kids that we brought on board. And it's interesting because when these kids move on to um, proper school, real school as I call it, it's been hard to let go. Because you have invested so much, you've given virtually the building blocks. Most of these ch children can now articulate so well, express themselves, they're very assertive. They tell you, I don't like this. I don't want this. Can I have this, please? So how do you say goodbye to these children? So um, that brought in another, another task at hand. And we decided that how about doing larger training sessions for families and parents who want to get to learn how to care for the kids. So right through the year, we do small workshops that are paid for so that we could use those money to give free scholarships to these children that we want to continue on in supporting their education. So that's one great fruit that has also been born out of this. I am in a place where I I feel like there's so much more to do, especially within my community. The center could host this much people, and you have women giving birth, like really, really uh, frequently. So I, I'm strongly, strongly uh, um, desiring to teach people on things like family planning, how, how, how do you plan your family? And now that you have the kids, how do you show them love and respect? Because a lot of people in this um, part of the world think you have to have money to care for your child. And that's a myth. That's like, it's, it's really a myth. The, the happiest children sometimes come from quote unquote, the poorest homes. So learning how to engage using your own space without any fancy toy. In fact, I tell the parents that can afford it, reduce screen time, go outdoors, use the stones to count. And we have such a beautiful topography. Count the leaves, look for sand, get them to measure the sand. Play with water, Sierra Leone is filled with water. Get them to experience nature. And there's so much more they learn from outdoors. Their motor skills get better. Their brain develops faster. It goes beyond teaching the child that A is for apple rather than showing the child this is an apple. Getting the child to experience the apple, feel the apple, taste the apple, Cheer the apple. That's another big thing for this small community at Nanya. It goes beyond one, two, threes, ABCs to social awareness. What's going on around us? What's happening? Why are we having floods in Freetown? We gotta care for the, the, the trees. We go outdoors and we plant. We plant flowers, we plant vegetables, and we talk about these things. So my babies, the toddlers as young as one, if they're done eating, they look for the waste bin because they see us doing that. And it brings me great joy 
that they go to a public space and they ask that their hands be washed. Oh, my hands are dirty. And this is knowledge for me. This is how education should be. Because when you inculcate the right habits and attitudes, you're grooming them for life, to be resilient and to understand that life could be good, happy, sad. And we talk about emotions. We start as, a, as early as three months in our little play groups. And we do a lot of role play. As you can see, I am very, very expressive. <laughs> <laughs> and we make phases. And we try to give them scenarios that are so simple, so simple. So when mommy says, when you say, mama, I want sweet, 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 and mama says, no, how do you feel? And you see their faces just reflect that sadness. Like, okay, so that's a sad face. Hands are not for heating. Hands are for drawing. Hands are for saying hello. Hands are for saying goodbye. Because it's about that balance. We bite. Why do we bite? It's a natural expression because we need our teeth to grind our food. But you don't bite your friends just because you cannot tell them to stop. So take a minute and tell your friend, please stop or hand me that toy. Can I take a turn now? So these little things make our work and the production, the quality of the work, just exceptional. Because when they go and they interact with other kids, everybody says, where's the child from? And they say, one um, daycare in Sierra Leone, really? <laughs> and <laughs> for me, that, that suppresses any money that I could make from this, because it assures me that when I'm gone, Sierra Leone is safe and the world is a better space. Wow. Oh. We're really tapping into the biggest treasure of Sierra Leone. Oh, yes. The minds of young people. Yes, I am. We are. You are. <laughs> that is so lovely and very inspiring. I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, you, you encourage uh, young ladies to study, to find their self-worth, and yet you're working in front of them as an example because you quit your job and you started Mania yes. with the support of your mom. Oh yes. What did people think when you quit your job and you said I want to go into, into childcare? Hmm. Okay. I know my papa would be annoyed if he gets to see this video someday. <laughs> so I'm very very close uh, with my family. My father told me point blank that I'm crazy, like you're crazy. Ariana, you don't, you don't decrease. Cause I was earning a lot of money. I was being paid in, in dollars, US dollars. Then one day you get up and like, I want to spend a bit more time with my son. So I'm stopping to go to work and then do what? Clean poop. Um, I had friends, okay. Technically, they were not my friends <laughs> because if your friends don't don't pull you down. So I had people I called my friends uh, laughed to my face that I was maybe going through some post trauma from childbirth. Like, how would you quit your life? You're just ascending your career. You're working for a multinational company to say you're going to go start a daycare. Like, what do you know about daycare? You took a few courses and so you're now an expert. So it was quite negative. Um, my mother has always been like one of my biggest supporters. She's like, are you sure about it? If you're sure about it, then I'm for it. And with my husband, he is, he is an entrepreneur. He's into big risk. His, his fear was, so now we're both going to be entrepreneurs. Oh, wow, that's a tough job. But he, he, he was supportive. Um, on days that we couldn't pay rent, he would chip in. Um, on days that I would go home and then cry, he would say, uh, let's pray about it. I hate to see you cry, 
But then on the days that you laugh, it makes me so, so happy. So it must be that you're doing something right. So generally, um, it was during Ebola that people really started appreciating my work. So um, I had a, like a friend who had a great contract with um, a certain company and we're doing psychosocial support for children across Sierra Leone. And she reached out to me that, okay, your center is closed now. And I, I, I hear you're devastated because then the warning bells, like everybody was like, we told you, now you're without a job. And she uh, called me on to join her in the project. And we started working right across Sierra Leone with, with the most deprived communities. That was when people really started seeing maybe it's a passion, other love, other dedication. And we had a lot of uh, camera on our faces most times. It was very public and people started taking note of it. When I put out the word on WhatsApp that we were relaunching the center and I had gone from not having a space I had lost the building that we had leased and, and spent thousands of dollars, never made that money back. And my, my mother lives next door, and this was her garden. And she said, well, how about you guys making use of it? I'm like, I know you love your flowers. Like, okay, make use of it. So I got a big loan from my husband again. A friend connected me with a building, a supplier, and then we built the space. Right there was a picture that I keep, uh, small beginnings, small beginnings. So we built the space and we're about to finish. We put out a notice that will be open in August and that was in June. And people started coming in. People started coming in like, so where is this coming from? So maybe what I didn't mention in the very beginning, aside of my friends that came in and people that came in for free, nobody wanted to come initially. I'll go sit at um, community centers, hospitals, talk to parents, help with the kids. Like, okay, it's nice that you're friendly and you want to help, but I'd rather stay home with my child. But it was the opposite after Ebola, people, came in and we were not even done with the building. So we had to start telling them, okay, go come in two weeks. Go come in three weeks. Now we have like a long waiting list that breaks my heart. Because if I had a bigger space, you know what that means. I'd be able to accommodate more children. We are full till September next year. That's how long the waiting list is. What do you think changed from the first opening? Mm. Then you say you had to close mm -hmm. during because of Ebola. Ebola yes, because okay. of Ebola. Because of Ebola, yeah. and it was difficult to find parents that wanted to trust yes. the center with the children. Mm -hmm. But then after Ebola, you reopened, and even before you reopened and with a new building, people were already coming. What had changed in the minds of people? I think it's a story that had changed. Um, we are very, very uh, traditional to some extent. So a young girl, at that time I wasn't even 30 yet, um, starting out in early childhood center, what does she know? She has only one child. On average, people have four or five kids here. And um, the few that came in, so this is why I, I believe in ripple effect and in the fact that nothing is small. So the few that came in initially did a fantastic job of, of spreading the word. They could see they could see the seeds that were sown. And then um, that work that led me into danger zones, like I feel like sometimes you've been sacrificed, like sacrificing yourself, or like what you guys are doing, that's having a cause that is not really about yourself, but how can I help? draws people to you because people tend to know that they have problems and they want to 
connect with people that have solutions to their problems. People that can walk the talk. Um, we stay open right through the year. We, we start as early as 7 in the morning, clock work. We're here till 6.30 on days that parents can't come because there's traffic. We're here till 7, 8. It takes a lot of dedication. So consistency, uh, giving your all, keeping, keeping the story to being authentic. It, it's not for show. It's, it's for, for the real things, to bless, to uplift, to support, empower. And um, when you do that, the success comes. <laughs> I, I love what you share because I think that is something that maybe entrepreneurs uh, often forget that yes. you start out and you, you put in the work, you put in the work, you are there, you're showing up yeah. and your mind tells you, you know, I should see more external results, but yeah. you don't know how the results are already working in the background. Yes. And then maybe sometime later you close and have mm -hmm. to reopen mm -hmm. the fruits start showing up. It's yes. like you cannot pull the grass to grow faster and you just need to have this trust to mm -hmm. keep going yeah. despite the what we usually say is outward success yeah. not being immediately visible yeah. but you can probably see the results with the few people that you interact yes. with and have their gratitude and, and do their best right? yeah. yeah i i i that's that's my philosophy and mind you like we life is not meant to be paying all of the time neither is it there there is no particular formula that you must suffer so you get the rewards later so to each person it might be different depending on your industry depending on um how you started out initially so i tell entrepreneurs that we all have to walk our own path and just listen to the messages that are around us so connect with your clients your clients get to tell you as much good and the bad. But if, if you scare them off and they're not, you're not honest with them. So when kids fall down here, we're honest to detail. We have nurses here, but we're honest to detail. Um, it happened in the playground. There's nothing outward, it's not showing. But it must be reported because you don't know the trauma that that has caused to the child um i don't know if maybe because i was blessed with so many different experiences before coming to this um i i survived multiple car crashes survived paralysis survived like different things so maybe i built up resilience to now get to this place this is why I said it's, it, the path might be different from, for every person, but you've been really honest with your, your clients. So my philosophy, the client is not always right, but we can work things out. Because when the client is always right, then you don't want to be at the wrong end of things. You want to put up a show and it doesn't work like that. Maybe because I'm dealing with humans rather than trading um, in goods or other services. But I think it is right that there's no one way. You can close down if you want to close at that point. It doesn't mean the dream is now dead. Sometimes it means you're now picking up speed. Mine was preempted by uh, Ebola. But honestly, who knows? Maybe if Ebola hadn't happened, I would have gone frustrated. But guess what? When Ebola happened, because of that work, I was contacted. So those things that I thought weren't showing, I was contacted. And in fact, I was further empowered with more training and more skills because of that. <laughs> and it reminds me of 
the story of the they call it the blind swimmer the mm. blind swimmer tries to cross the lake but he does not know how far he is yeah. so he might be very close to the other side and he goes okay two more strokes and if I don't reach the other side I'll go back and then the way back might be the long one okay. where life is already working so much that you're almost there but you how do you know oh, yeah. you know just you have to have that, yeah. that trust yeah. Yeah. could you could you share about the, the childcare scene market or just childcare in yeah. general in Sierra Leone because you seem to be very innovative with what you're doing Thank you. That's a great compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, initially, when when I started out, it was it was pretty much a virgin uh, industry, and it it was known that people my mother's age, retired women, uh, would go into that. But our setup here is slightly different from what. Sierra has ever seen before we started because initially the child care scene was just about caring for the child, making sure they're well fed, um, they sleep and you mind them till their parents pick them up. When we started out then we introduced this whole um, philosophy of getting them ready for school and for life. I am deeply, deeply, deeply grateful that I now see on this, on my role, there are about three or four child uh, centers now. And they're shocked each time I refer people to them uh, because I, I feel like really, really happy. A child has been born every, every second. When I started out, I had like two or three options. Now, just on my road, there's four. That's amazing. And when you go, it's interesting. This is why we, we share so much. When we started sharing, once again, um, elders, role models in my society called me up. Be careful. The competition might just steal all your ideas. And then I said, exactly so. Um, I am sharing so that they see and they know how to do things right. So that we all learn. So that when they see me doing things wrong, they can call me up. And it's interesting, I have a big sister, she has a, a center here. She was one of the few people that started out before me. I now call her my big sister because she connected, she was the only person that connected with me. When I was about to start, I went to all of the centers and I introduced myself, oh, I know nothing about this. I've taken a few courses, but that's all. I would need your help. But you know how it is. People were not too keen. But she, um, she lives in England and she has people running her center. When she got the message and she came in that summer, she reached out. She wanted to meet this lady and we, we connected. So she's an older lady, so I call her my big sister. So my big sister now said, it's amazing that we have like a mirror effect, very similar programs. Everybody has their own little thing going on, but we're able to support each other. And there are times I, I see things not going too well with, I would reach out on WhatsApp. Thank goodness for technology. And she would do the same and she would advise. And that has been really reassuring. So even before I started getting international support, that was great. That was different. So since then, I, I made a pledge that whosoever is willing, I can help. In fact, this uh, September, there's a new center opening in the Far East. I'm going to go support them. I have been doing um, lots of work with different centers, mostly voluntarily. Um, those that can afford it, like pay for my transport and things like that. And there's a value in teaching. The more you teach, the more you learn, the more you so grow. True. So true. Since I learned that, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs>
I love that. And you know, I think it's also the big difference between someone who has a strong why, um, understands that, you know, if, I'm, if what I'm doing is being emulated, I might learn even from what they are doing and become better. And the problem or the challenge is so, let's say, big, that there's room for more. And if you want to live in a wealthy country, meaning it's safe, people are educated, you have a doctor when you need one, the roads are good, then you need a generation of people with the mindset to do that. So you're, whether you're so supporting your supposed competition, mm -hmm. you're always actually working on the wealth of the nation. Oh, so yes. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's a beautiful thing, like you said. That's, that's assurance that my child can grow up and he'll get the best. Because yeah. there's going to be a lot more value in his generation than mine. Yeah. Oh, I love that. What did, you, what did you do before the uh, child care? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I've always wanted to work with kids. So I went and when I was getting my um, undergrad, I did biology with the intention because my dad said I was too little. So he wanted me to get the first degree before going into medicine. Because my, my late granddad, one of the biggest mentors, he passed away um, in April. Okay. Um, he, he was a pediatrician and I would go into his office as a little girl and I would just feel at home. So everybody, everybody said, oh, she's going to work with kids. She's going to be the next doctor in the family. When I was done with my, my, my degree, um, life happened. I had to go to work. I met this amazing lady. Um, I mean, at a Dumbuya, she's an entrepreneur. And she had just come back from the States and she was setting up. Our office was one table. <laughs> and we won a big contract. And that was the beginning of my, my life in uh, the business world. I went on and I did professional courses in management. And I thought that was it. I was going to be there, make good money. That turned into the beginning of my engagement with startups. My, in my last job, I was a business support manager for um, Ericsson and Ericsson was doing a uh, service, managed service contract for Airtel then, that's now Orange. Then I went into logistics and coordination. I love learning. I, I do not believe that you should be doing something that you're not qualified for. So wherever my interest goes, I study. So I got into project management and after that, I'll help my friends when they want to set up something until I decided to, to quit. So that was my life, quote unquote, before then. I thought I was going to be this big CEO, go on and get an international master's in business. And then this whole thing for my childhood came back. It came back so strong when I had my baby. Like, oh no. And my grand uncle said, why not? You can go for it. So now, uh, for the last five years, it's, it's really been early childhood education, caregiving. And because of this way I get pulled onto people, I, I picked up a certification in coaching, assertiveness rights. I'm still supporting startups and every now and again I have another baby business, another baby idea. So. And I'm fussy about results about results no matter how small so last year i got um into uh, i got a certification in results coaching in my free time to supplement all the mother theresa work that i do that's how my family calls it 
I, I, I help train um, organizations like the frontline staff, the mid-level staff, business executives on soft skills, being a bit more emotionally relaxed, being more assertive in the office, letting your desires be known and manifested. Basically what you teach the children as yes. well. <laughs> <laughs> We all need it. We all need it. We all need it. Um, in our in our society, you know, we have like sixty thousand plus thoughts going on in our heads every second, and yet, that's did I get it correct? Yeah. We have so many people saying no, no, no to themselves every minute. Even people that we think have arrived. They keep saying no, and they keep telling themselves to shut up. So my kids, they don't take no for an answer, and you cannot quiet them down. And I think adults that want to push their dreams forward should also benefit from that. Say what you feel and say it from the heart. Go for what you believe in. Don't listen to all the distractions. There's always going to be somebody that will tell you that, no, you can't do it. Or you're too dark, your head is too large, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too dull, you're too loud. What would be your advice to a young person in Sierra Leone today? So think outside of the box. Look beyond our environment and reach out to the world. I love books. I love research. I like finding out, asking questions. Every young person that gets the chance, go around your neighborhood. Talk to the people in your space. Use your phones wisely. Don't waste time on social media, Facebook. Doing what? Look for free courses online. You know me, you name them. Engage yourself because there's always a solution waiting to be found. Because there's always someone that's worse than you. You see, in, in my space, youth, the opportunities, like 60% are unemployed. So you go and you pick up a degree and there's no job, there's no work. Does that mean you have to sit down? In this space, with the kids, we talk about your skills, your talents, what can you do with your hands, what can you do with your feet? Because we want, by the time you get to teenage, the youth age, if you can get a white collar job, fine. If you can find your own niche, if you can create your own job, a word that, that you coined, <laughs> that no one knows what's about. Maybe it's something out of a coconut pan. But then if you didn't know that earlier on, you get stuck. So this is why I I, I stay um, working in this in this niche because pulling them up from, from, from there is, is so hard. And maybe that's why I share a lot because we don't get a lot of positive role models around that want to talk about how they've made it to the top. They don't, they always care to share, but when young people reach out, ask questions, look around their environment, and it, it's, it's always about them wanting to go to, go to England, to go to, to the West, no! It's right here. 
within your space that great big idea is waiting for you i love that i love that you share that because we were just talking with an entrepreneur and she said you know the innovation depends so much on the context so what might be no innovation at all in the united states or england could completely transform people's lives here so why yeah. not take something that you can easily find online and exactly. see how it solves a problem oh, yeah. Yeah. well how would you know if you don't reach out if you yeah. don't look yeah. for yeah. it yeah. Yeah. sure the first thing like on this you you mentioned that on this when you restarted the center your husband gave you a loan to, to start it. How did you start the first center? Like, what was your, what was the step, you know? How, did, how does one start a center? Yes. Um, I, I mentioned I had a very good job. My dad's an accountant. Um, I've been loaning kids since I was in primary school. I had a, a micro credit. I would loan kids that can't handle their lunch money well and they pay me back with interest. <laughs> oh, wow. So I was that was your first <laughs> business, huh? <laughs> wow. And don't let her hear me. I would loan my mom money when she needs <laughs> when she needed extra money. <laughs> so uh, I had a little, like a good, a sizable amount saved. And I didn't get all the advice that I needed. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to start something new, check all the angles, all the corners. I thought I would, I, I was just supposed to reach out to the educationist and the nursing and pediatrics world. The professional side of the, uh, the know-how side of I didn't know I, I, I needed to refresh my memory on those skills I had in school. <laughs> Learning lunch money. So, <laughs> I took most of what I had saved up over the, the last couple of years and rented a space, and furnished the space. Like, I have um, a lot of uh, friends and family outside of Sierra Leone, so it was easy to ship things because even books I had to get here. So by the time I got started, I had like 5% of that money left. Um, it was tough. I knew that investing in clothes has always been a waste of money. So I'd always invested in trinkets and uh, gold and diamonds and little things, like nice things. So when that 5% ran out, my first part of call was to start selling off. It was hell. Because when you go sell in the black market, the prices drop. But at least I got some money to take me through the next couple of months. And then it was really, really just my husband again, pumping in. And he would tell me, okay, you have to pay back. Some days I paid back, some days I didn't. Yeah, that's the truth. You're a real business partner, huh? <laughs> it's like, so there's the love side and there's the business side. The business yeah? side. <laughs> but when um, we restarted, before we restarted, I connected with a real good friend who is, I call her finance guru. And I told her that I need help. I need to know the numbers. I have a great business plan, but that's about it. I need to know what I need to break even. I need to know what I need to have in my account for rainy days. So when I restarted, I had a, a proper plan, like a better sense of direction. And it, it's helped. I have not loaned in a while. I think my husband is a bit happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Touchwood, thank you, Lord. 
I'm able to pay my staff on time on a particular day every month. That's security. Um, even our dear government doesn't offer that kind of security to their staff. We're able to keep the, the center fresh, clean. Um, we're able to donate to other centers and orphanages. We're able to buy new things. I am not making profit that would get me into a limo, but there's hope for for the center of excellence that I dream of, like the the big the big big plan, my ten year plan. If you could partner with just anybody or ask anybody for a resource, who would you ask and what would you ask them for? If I could partner with anybody um, in Sierra Leone, it will be uh, the government of Sierra Leone and I would like for them to give me a land. Then I'll be able to build a center that will be able to accommodate as many kids as possible. That would also be able to cater for expectant mothers, young children who have no place to, to play, young children who want to learn and they can't learn, or an organization that is willing to give me that continuous knowledge, that gene pool of knowledge. So I would partner with UNICEF and I support them with their work and they support me with knowledge, expertise, learning materials, Oh, great. So let's hope that either UNICEF and or the Sierra Leone government will listen to this at some point in time. Yes. <laughs> That's a big prayer. <laughs> Was there ever a day where you thought, okay, we cannot continue? Yes. It's, an, it's, it's, as, it's, it's as often as every month. That's how bad. And this is why I said everybody's path is different. So now I'm learning to take breaks in between. I'm learning to delegate better. I'm learning that as an entrepreneur, it's a 24-7 job. But my mental health is very important. So if I'm down with malaria, I don't have to come just because I have to prove a point. Because all these external stresses, they, they weigh down on you. And then we have all these other environmental challenges. You come in and, and the taps are closed and you need water for your business. You fill in the tanks and you find out there is a leak. You need electricity and the generator goes off. Or you have a power cut. Last week I was, I was in a bad place. We had had a power cut for five whole days. I had to run the generator, the babies would be pointing to the, the, um, the light bulbs. It was raining outside, we couldn't go outside. So I had to spend a good amount of money keeping the generator on. So every month, I am not kidding, there would be a day that I would, I would have to ask myself, um, so I keep a gratitude journal. Because when, when, when I ask myself, like, why are you doing this anyway? I need to go back to that, like, just look at those little things. Like, now the kids are saying goodbye this morning. Um, some parents came in and they came in with cards. So we stick up everything, like, on the world. I just remind us to keep you grounded. Pictures, lots of it to keep you grounded. Because it's, it's, it's cruel out there sometimes. There are days um, that we don't, we, don't, we don't get payments on time and we, we, we provide food for the kids. And you start thinking, so how do, I, how do I make that happen? It's a lot of pressure and I do want to give up sometimes, but I'm still here. <laughs> oh, please stay. <laughs> I have one more question I'm curious about. 
the training all these talented young women, has any of them ever expressed the desire to start her own center? Okay, um, there, there is. Um, there is one that told me that she has relatives in Australia and she's expressed the desire that she would, she would really like them to support her financially and um, she's counting on my support. And I said, yes. So guess what? I'm not researching. So how do you do franchises? How can I replicate this? So, cause she's like, so can we do everything like you're doing here? Why not? Well then can I call it night? So why not? So there's another possibility there already. I, I told them even this morning, like, so every now and again, we'll have like, motivational talk in the morning and I tell them so there are two or three that need to take their exams like ladies we need to study because someday you're going to have to do your own stuff and you're going to need this so it is a reality that I'm very open to and for example my chef so I have a licensed chef. She makes the, the best meals where you missed lunchtime. <laughs> um, she, she, she has told me, so her, her husband is also a chef and they're raising funds and they want to open up their restaurant. And she told me that, so um, Auntie Ariana, because that's like out of respect. Auntie Ariana, when we, when we open up a restaurant, does that mean I'm going to be out of a job? I say, no. That means my kitchen is going to be spotless. And then I'll have to find a motorbike or a keke. I'll go pick up the food. That's like one less headache. I don't have to manage someone and you're going to grow from it because you're going to be supplying a center food. So if even no one shows up to your restaurant, <laughs> you're guaranteed a source of income. And I know a lot of people think I'm crazy when I think like this, but I wonder if we all thought like this, how easy it would be. Somebody lifted me up. So I am midway through on the ladder, trying to catch my balance. But if I can help you up one step further, why not? Why not? That's how it should be. That's how it should be.